those of you who know me, like I say, I, I'm part of the I4IS. Um, originally, if you don't know, I was a school teacher for a few years, craft design technology, and I couldn't afford to be a school teacher when interest rates were 15 and a half percent. And uh, I became a bit immersed in it. I joined the military, which helped me to pay all my bills, fortunately, and uh, did 20 years as an RAF engineering officer, mainly on avionics. So I was, I'm not a rocketeer or anything, but or a sooty or um, I was an avionics specialist, effectively. Um, and as an officer, mainly, it was just a question of having the uh, experts work for me, to be honest. So today I'm going to do, um, talk about precursor missions. It's mainly my opinion on, on precursor missions. It's, um, it's not anybody else's. But let's see if, uh, if it's of interest to, to you guys. I think it always follows on quite nicely from, from a from a, a, a presentations we do with some of the university students with our courses on Starship Engineering. You would have heard some of it if you were in the meeting on May, in May, but I did touch on some of these things and we'll overlap on a few of these things. And I'm gonna expand on those the precursor missions which we didn't get have time to get into in May. And that's what we'll cover, what's on the screen now, hopefully you can see that. But first of all, what are they not? Okay, we'll not be talking about interstellar travel today. Uh, we won't be talking about man or person colonization or settlement. It's just um, a pre what might be considered interstellar precursor mission. So what are they? In my mind, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's obviously everyone talks about going the extreme distance, you know, exploring outside of the uh, planetary solar system, for example. But also, importantly, uh, which Dot often looked at, is it, aspects of it can be developing some aspects of technology or uh, addressing spacecraft speed or whatever that's going to make on the roadmap to going into stellar all important steps to be taken on that roadmap you know because in my university days it was easy the the basic solar system and going around the solar was all we had to worry about and that's it on the left there but nowadays there's so much more to see and so more, more many more places to go so um it's not just nine planets it's eight planets plus all the kuiper belt etc etc so that's a, sort of the target uh, audience that we we hope to aim for and how we how are we going to do this and, and and why would we do this who can we get to pay for these sorts of things it's all the, the questions that come up all the time but we'll just start with a little bit of basics and i apologize if you know all this or you've heard me say it all before but just puts everything into perspective um, you'll have probably seen this slide, I call it our interstellar precursor probes. Um, you know, it's 30 or 40 years of development, but if you look at the speeds of the Pioneer 10 and 11, Voyager 1 and 2, they're not much different from New Horizons 30 years later. You know, it's basically because we're still using the same technology from 30 or 40 years ago. So that's an issue that we need to look at. Look at. And of course, if... Um, can I use the pointer on here? I can, yeah. Let's get the laser pointer on here. If you look at the distances involved, you know, we talk about this logarithmic stage uh, diagram where the Earth is at one astronomical unit. And if you can see on the diagram, the Saturn is about 10 astronomical units. The edge of the solar heliosphere, the heliosphere in the direction of travel of the, the sun is at over, just over 100 astronomical units. And then it's further out. And Alpha Centauri here is out at... Uh, 270,000 astronomical units. Now, I always think if you're traveling at the speed of a Voyager, going two or three astronomical units per year, so if you imagine if you take one large step, that's about one meter, you go in two or three meters a year, then think about where you are now, then Alpha Centauri is something like 270 uh, kilometers away, and it's gonna take an awful long time to walk there going at two or three paces a year. So that's the issue again with the the propulsion technology that we have. Uh, but we have achieved certain things that we have achieved. This is our best picture. That was our best picture of, of uh, uh, Pluto from uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. And now we physically had a, a spacecraft with telescopes flying by. We've got a much better image of that uh, that body, which we would never have been able to do if we didn't actually physically go there. And there's some amazing photographs. Now, I have no idea what this pocked mark surface is all about. I don't know if anybody else has any a good idea, but 
it's, it's just fa fascinating, some of the photographs that we've seen from the New Horizons probe. And if you look at some of the other information coming back, we didn't even know what we were going to find out when we flew past New Horizons. I actually thought it was just going to be a, a rocky body like the moon. So how wrong was I? But then we found out other things like the atmosphere that's there during the sort of summer months of, of uh, Pluto's orbit. Not only that, we also were able to see fields of methane. What's this methane doing on there? Just fascinating information that we would not have got if we hadn't have gone there. And of course, New Horizons didn't stop with the flyby of, of, of Pluto. It's obviously seen those uh, small moons of Pluto. The plan was to go to another object, and that's an artist impression of the object before we got there, of what became, I think it was M MU69 originally, then they called it Ultima Thule, and then it's now Arakoth or something is the name for it. And it looks like two objects that have just gently nudged up together. Absolutely amazing. It looks like a snowman, I think was the comment at the time. Amazing, amazing photographs, and now New Horizons has continued on into the into the into the Kuiper Belt. So, what sort of missions might we look at? And I'm going to take a I, I've got a number of missions to talk about, and I couldn't find the best way to order them. So it may jump about a little bit as we go through these, but I think it will cover all of the aspects that I want to bring up or introduce. But I apologise if I do jump around a little bit. But what could we actually do? And one of the questions, and it happened a few years ago, they were asking, what could we, what's the physical best thing we could achieve in the, with our current technology in the outer solar system? And there was this uh, Keck or KISS, Keck Institute of uh, Space Studies, you know, funded by the Keck Foundation to the tune of $24 million, I think, over eight years. Brilliant. If only we could find a Mr. Keck in the UK. Um, they had two one-week uh, workshops where they developed a program to see what's the best we could achieve. And I think if you've seen some other ones, you may have seen some of these images. But basically, they came up with a, a system to, to loop around the Earth, a, a, a spacecraft to loop around the Earth to pick up a gravitational slingshot from the Earth, go out to Jupiter, and then use Jupiter to drop right into the sun, into the sun, uh, near, not into the sun, but near the sun, to get a gravitational slingshot boosted by an Oberth maneuver. So, going to fire a rocket at this perihelion, at the nearest approach to the sun, which they reckon, if you see this number just here, they might be able to achieve 13 AU per year. So that's a great increase on the Voyager New Horizons figure. Still not huge, but it's much better. And that's, that would allow the system to get into the, into the uh, Kuiper belt instead of 30 or 40 years or tw 10, tw 11, 12 years of, of uh, New Horizons much, much quicker. And just for the rocketeers amongst us, I may have shown you that, but there's some background, just the three stages basically of the, the spacecraft in space. And... Um, there's some of the breakdowns. So I love the optimisms of the Americans. They've got the SLS on the side here. SLS Block 1B, and that was a few years ago, so we're, we're still waiting. But um, yeah, I mean, they did work on that in quite some detail. And if you read your JBIS, you know, there's this JBIS issue in 2019 where they basically updated that with um, APL, JHU APL. And they've come up with a version where they're looking at trying to go a thousand AU with a sort of spacecraft that's de it's developed from that original KISS study, I think. And you can get all the details in that issue of JBIS. I guess everyone's been able to have a copy of the slides after we finish. So I put these references so you can go and look them up for yourselves. But it's really interesting. That's the best it can achieve with the technology that we have at the moment. And it's also in Acta Astronautica if you want to, to read Ralph McNutt's version. So that allows us to get out into the uh, Kuiper belt where there's all these very interesting objects that have been discovered over the last 20, 30 years that were not known about when I was an astronomy student all those years ago. Now this is interesting because we now think a lot of them may have subsurface water oceans. So it's a bit of a drive from the astrobiologist to maybe go out and investigate some of these things. One proposal that has been talked about, it's not, not gone forward yet, is to think about, well, what can we do instead of going all the way to the Kuiper belt? Is there any other options where we might look for subsurface um, oceans? And we can we'll overlook Enceladus and all the other interesting things and, and look at the outer solar system at the moment. 
And one suggestion that came up was to go to Triton, because Triton, that's the largest moon of Neptune, is a very, very unusual object. It's in a retrograde orbit, so it goes around backwards from the way that uh, Neptune uh, rotates itself which is the only large moon to do that. There are some smaller moons, quite a number of smaller moons, which probably cast, captured asteroids elsewhere in the solar system that go in a retrograde motion. But this is the only large body, which makes people suspect that it's very likely a captured uh, Kuiper belt object. So, I mean, people have talked about getting an orbiter around Uranus and Neptune, if we could get an orbiter sort of in a Cassini style, Cassini Huygens style, to go to Neptune, we could investigate Triton in some depth and we would already have effectively a captured Kuiper belt object to look at before we have to push out into the Kuiper belt itself. Still tricky to do and it would be incredibly tricky to go into orbit around Neptune, so it would be pushing the technology a lot. But as I mentioned, there's very there's thought to be a subsurface ocean, so through the elliptical orbit and tidal heating and uh, uh, radioactive decay in, inside. So there is, you know, a lot of interest to do such a thing. Well, that got me thinking about what other adventurous or, or, or other missions are they think, really think about. And this is one that I had not known about until a few weeks ago when I started to look into this. This is an, uh, a mission that's supposed to launch next year to the Trojan asteroids. And I'll come on to tell you about them in a moment. But this, is, this is not an acronym. It's actually named after the, the bones of a, uh, an early hominid that's supposed to be related to Homo sapiens. So, and I'll explain why in a moment. But this is a very interesting uh, mission. If it goes off next year, it'll be very exciting to see them some do this. So let's have a look at this one. I don't know if you can see the anim animation in the bottom left. The Trojans are sort of captured asteroids that are in, a, in the orbit of Jupiter, but they're in that sort of gravitational balance, the Lagrange point between sun, the Sun and Jupiter, where it's quite stable. They're in a sort of slight potential well, gravitational well. So they can sit, once they get in there, it's very hard to nudge them out, or it's harder to nudge them out. So they can be in stable orbit, orbits, either leading Jupiter or trailing Jupiter for millions, billions of years. So this mission, if you look at this green trajectory, they're just gonna loop around the Earth a couple of times to get gain speed, then fly out through the main asteroid belt into the Trojan uh, asteroids. And in fact, they're gonna see seven or eight different asteroids in the Trojan belt in, in effectively one mission over about six years or something. So they're gonna fly past a couple of the binaries, and when they finished in this, the leading Trojans, the L4 point, they're gonna then swing back past the Earth and um, go into L5 and visit another tr Trojan asteroid there. Now, I find that just amazing because that means after they've done that first, which is the main mission, effectively it can be fixed in that loop for the next 30 or 40 years. So as long as that uh, spacecraft lasts, they'll be able to go back and forth past the Earth to the, uh, the different L uh, Trojans and just keep investigating more and more of these, uh, these asteroids. Interestingly, the the kit that they're going to put on this spacecraft is is uh, upgrades of a lot of the stuff on new horizons so we're going to get those images we're going to get that information that we had for for pluto etc from these trojans fascinating now if i could see my presenter's notes i've got some other important notes to tell you but i can't see it on my computer at the moment so i shall just mention them if i think of it but uh, that's the that's lucy and like i say it's not an acronym it's named after that uh, is actually the person who discovered that hominid. And I believe the, the asteroid they're going to pass, you can see the pointer in the main asteroid belt, is named Donaldson, which is named after the guy who discovered that, uh, that skeleton. So I think that's why they've named the, the mission that way. Another one I was reading about was a mission to the centaurs. Who's, who's familiar with centaurs? Now, centaurs are asteroidal comets or cometary asteroids orbiting out in by the gas giants out beyond Saturn around Uranus and uh, Neptune that most people believe are, are not in stable orbits they believe they are probably Kuiper belt objects that have been nudged out of the Kuiper belt through gravitational influence and then got themselves in these temporary orbits there's five on here that you can see with the solid orbits 
but there's many, many more that you can see on this one, which just illustrates how many objects. And I believe I've heard or read there's actually more objects out there than there are in the asteroid belt. So there's a lot of interesting material out there that we could possibly visit. A lot of them are on eccentric and quite inclined orbits. Now that's unusual, but a few of them are on very inclined orbits, up towards the 90 degrees, almost a sort of polar type orbits. And what I've, I was reading a paper just recently in, in the monthly notice of the Royal Astronomical Society, they talked about these actually might be stable orbits for billions of years. So whereas the original thoughts were that they were mostly captured um, trans-Neptunian or uh, Kuiper Belt objects, these could even be interstellar objects. I think there's like 17 of them that has been identified that could be in stable orbits. And the proposal is obviously to send a, uh, a spacecraft to them, and that would be a really testing mission. Unfortunately, I don't think it's being progressed further at the moment, but I put on here, this is the paper that it came from. You can read about it from these abstracts. And this is the monthly notices uh, that talked about these stable orbits. So, you know, that would be such a testing mission extreme mission very unfavorous to try and do to really push the boundaries of the technology great so what else could we do there's the opportunity of chasing what i call interstellar objects you may have heard of uma uma excuse my uh, pronunciation so that's part of uh, from the i4s point of view when that was discovered Within seven to 14 days, the team had written the paper on how we might do a mission to chase uh, Uma Uma called Project Lyra and catch up with it before it exited, exited the solar system. It would be tricky, but even though Uma Uma had already passed the sun, was on its way out of the solar system, they were able to show. And I think it's basically based on the KISS type uh, uh, system. I wasn't involved directly with the mission uh, at the time but that's that's what was done and um, I think the it went on to the archive after about 10 days and it was picked up by Harvard is it their digest so their weekly digest and I think it was like one of the top five most influential papers I can't remember exact, the exact words or whatever it is they say about that but it was one of the top five papers to go on to the archive in that week so quite an achievement and I put the references on there because it's developed since then Obviously, we've discovered that there's another one, Borisov, is another interstellar object that's passing through the solar system. So we could try and chase them. Um, it does mean, I guess, that this might be quite common. So when we first did in 2017, looked at Lyra, we're thinking this might be a one-off, we have to do it. To thinking, well, maybe these new telescopes, astronomical tele telescopes coming online, will be discovering, I think I've seen some stats of about one per year so there's not the same pressure to go for Borisov or Uma Uma but we could pick and be ready for a suitable opportunity in the future and there's some references from ours there our project work and there's a picture because we realize that you know it's difficult with the chemical propulsion to catch up with these things it's slow it's hard it's a hard thing to do but you know, if, if something like Breakthrough Starshot is developing their laser technology for, for boosting their, their laser sail craft, and that presumably have those lasers, maybe not 500 gigawatts coming online straight away, they might be developing one gigawatt lasers and stuff. We could, we could, in a few years time, with the current technology basically, produce a small spacecraft to fly past there's a fleet of them on this diagram flying past uh, Uma Uma. So I guess the team thought you could even still catch up with Uma Uma using these things, but um, very ambitious and looking at new technology. I, I, I recently found this list. I added it in because there's a lot of the papers we've written are available through the archive on, online free to, to download and view. So that will be on this list if you want to have a look, have a look at it. So with laser sail technology maybe coming on with Breakthrough Starshot, what other options have we got? Well, electric propulsion, and I, as always, have to apologise for talking about specific impulse in seconds, but electric ion propulsion has a much better specific impulse, which is effectively a, a measure of efficiency of your, your, your system. 
and you know a chemical system might be at best 500 seconds well specific involves for an iron engine could be much more than that it means you need less fuel um you can run these engines they only work in space because the thrust is tiny you have to switch them on and uh, keep them on for years sometimes but they can be useful and you see we've had uh, deep space one you know uh, fly by of a comet and then we had the dawn mission which is just amazing where we went through this Vesta and Ceres in the asteroid belt and orbited them. Amazing outcomes from that. So it's it's a it's a potential for the future to think about using iron drives. And you'll see why I mentioned that as well in a moment. And I just put this one up because this is an old slide now, but they were looking at maybe some developments taking up to 10,000 just about specific seconds, specific impulse. So that that just makes the, the, the missions easier and easier to do. I will mention Vasimir, I always do it. It's gone a bit quiet at the moment, but the, the, the thing with the iron drive is you can't increase the energy in your iron drive without destroying the grids and things that are used to set up the potential difference to get your irons to the speed you want them to. So Vasimir was a way of looking at beyond that and they call it a you know, plasma rocket effectively. And that's uh, shown in the next slide where you, you have your ionized, where they cut a cold plasma, but it might be an ionized gas, which you then just use effectively a big microwave oven to boost the energy as high as you possibly can and out through a magnetic nozzle, stream these particles at the, the highest speed possible. The highest speed possible increases your specific impulse, increases the performance of your, your rocket. Now, I, this all depends on the, uh, the power driving the system, and I've heard they've tested a 100 kilowatt version. They're looking at this, testing a 200 kilowatt version. And the stories a few years ago was if you could build one of two megawatts, you could get to Mars in 39 days or something. That was the PR stuff, but you know, it's gone very quiet. So you professionals, some of you professionals may know why that is. It, I suspect the performance may not be as good as they hoped, and we'll, we'll have to see how that goes. So what could we do to encourage some of these extreme missions? What are the science justification? I'll just run through this because you will have seen some of these, I think, in the last uh, presentations. You know, we could go to 30 to 50 astronomical, that's the Kuiper belt, heading out towards the nose of the direction of the sun's motion in the galaxy. You've got the energetic neutral atoms that we don't know what's causing that. We've got these, these um, Kuiper belt objects that are in that direction, it'd be very useful to go that way to find out about them and to maybe take a CubeSat impactor, something like that. Who knows what you could do? You could do background science on the cosmic rays, solar wind science, and because you're out a distance from the sun, you can do the parallax science and astrometry. That's recently been shown from, uh, from New Horizons, I think, which I didn't think would be a great benefit, but I was surprised by the results they showed from New, New Horizons, I think it was. If you go further, so we're looking at 100 astronomical units, there's this information about the edge of the solar heliosphere where it impacts with the galaxy's interstellar medium. We really don't know what is going on there. There's some fascinating information coming from Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, conflicting information from Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, so we need some more samples. And there's all these things that are listed down the side here that we could investigate by going to 100 AU. More there, there's a bit more about uh, the uh, heliosphere. And I like this, there's this picture here of the astrosphere of LL Arania, Aronius, I, I, I don't know, Arrhenius, could say, which is a real photograph from Hubble. And that's exactly what they think the sun might be doing as it pushes through the galactic medium. Now, interesting, I've seen recent results from, I think from Voyager 2 that suggest it might be like, I don't know, the ponytails or something. I'm not quite sure how they're describing them at the moment, but a bit different from just a, a bow wave like that. But it, we don't really know and we won't know unless we're able to go sometime soon. Outside of that, so this is the original KISS study going to 200 astronomical units. We're now in the pristine interstellar medium which we have no idea about all sorts of things about. We don't know about the interstellar magnetic field. We don't know about the cosmic ray uh, spectrum because we, we think a lot of the low energy cosmic rays are, are blocked by the solar, the sun's magnetic field. So we don't know about them. We could find out all these amazing scientific reasons for going. 
And if we get to 550 astronomical units, you may have heard about the sun's focal point. Now that's where, if you get to 550 AU and further, you can use the sun as a gravitational lens. And the amazing thing about using the sun as a gravitational lens is that there's this factor here, they, they calculate that uh, an object would be amp uh, amplified by a factor of 10 to the power eight. That is a, a huge magnification. And if you could imagine, I don't know, if you could send a spacecraft going in the opposite direction to Alpha Centauri, I would definitely want to have a look at a, magnitude, a magnification of 10 to the eight backwards past the sun to Alpha Centauri to see exactly what's going on in there. Now, people have talked about this for years and no progress really has been made, I think, because everyone thinks 550 AU is just totally out of our, our league. But it is something we should target. And I, and I would always promote these sorts of, uh, let's call them extreme missions. But if they're going to take 100 years to get there, then it's, too, it's, 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 it's a defunct mission, really. Okay. So that's my talk, and I'd be very interested because some of I know some very knowledgeable people on this uh, on this group, and I'd be very happy to hear your discussions afterwards. But that's my thinking about some extreme missions that will test technology, will test distances, and reasons why we might go. And I just want to mention a couple of other considerations that I think important, which sort of underpin a lot of what we we're trying to do. You know, the biggest challenge we have is just the cost of going to space. You know, I remember, I don't know, I think it was something $80,000 per kilogram I saw to go into low Earth orbit during the Apollo era. $20,000 per kilogram for the shuttle. Now they're talking of thousands of dollars, $5,000 per kilogram um, to get into low Earth orbit. Thanks to things like these, uh, uh, the Falcon Heavy, which, uh, you know, I'm very lucky to have a home out in Florida. So I can see from my drive, I can see the launches. And um, we watched the launch of the test flight in two years ago and saw it take off. But we, ha we had to run inside to watch the telly for the boosters landing. But to me, it was like almost like science fiction coming real. This really made, it really had an impact on me to think, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer. I don't normally get excited about things, but I got excited by that, the, the dual boosters landing thinking that this this really is like they're, they're pushing the boundaries and now i think um musk is is, is a, a geeky version of um richard branson or something he's now flying these they look like grain silos into or hopping them at the moment and they'll be going further soon and that will be part of the starship program they're developing and if you look at the cost and you look at his tweets and i know he exaggerated well exaggerate is that the right word he says a lot you know, you might be talking about 10 or tens of dollars per kilogram to go into low Earth orbit. Now, that is cheaper than building a house in London or in New York. So once it gets to that stage, who knows what might become possible in space or what we could lift into space to, to carry all sorts of amazing missions. And the other side of the coin is, is advancing these technologies. And I don't, I don't mean to... Uh, I don't mean to make any political statement, but what I'm trying to say here is you can look at something like a, a Spitfire. That's the refinement, absolutely epitome of the technology that was available to for a, uh, a plane in the Second World War. Absolutely the outer limits of the technology. You can't progress that anymore, really. You have to push on to something like a jet engine, which they struggled through by the end of the war, and you've got the Gloucester Whittle E28, which is a performance that's probably less than the best Spitfires. But you have to push on with that technology, otherwise we're not going to go anywhere. And I was very excited to see that, uh, Bob, you mentioned that uh, Mark's going to talk about the Scorpion, because I thought about talking about the Scorpion, because I think the Scorpion and that sort of nuclear thermal engine or nuclear thermal hybrid electric is going to be fundamental to getting around the solar system. And I talked to my friend Richard Osborne, as some of you may know, and he wants to strip this... Uh, serpent engine on part of the scorpion hot rod it he calls and see what we might be able to do with in the outer solar system so that'd be fun to see but you've got to push through we've got to have these advantages because no matter how what we do with our chemical technology we're going to be limited so i'll just summarize a little bit that's my run through i think there's good scientific reasons 
there's developments in technology, there's developments in the, the cost that's going to really make a difference to what sort of precursor missions we could do. And I am really chuffed to see, having found out, you know, getting ready for this, that there is, there's some missions which are pushing the boundaries of technology. For example, the one thing I didn't mention about uh, the Lucy mission going past those eight asteroids, what a complex navigational issue that is. Now, they now start to alternate, automate more of the guidance and navigation. I don't know how far they've got with it on that system. It'd be worth looking into. But if you go to, if you go to uh, the nearest star systems, the, star, the, the systems that go there are going to have to be automated. They have to be intelligent to do a lot of those things themselves. But that's the sort of thing that we can do in the near future. Challenging distances, other issues to sort out, but, but I think great rewards. And if we can persuade the astronomers to back some of these things, you never know what we might get funded. Um, don't tell them. The key is that this will then lead to technologies that are definitely on the interstellar roadmap. And that's what I like about talking about these things. And I would normally talk about the potential destinations now in, in a follow-up lecture, but uh, that's where I'd like to finish here. What did I put next? Oh yes, you can find out more, do a bit of uh, publicizing for John. In our, this is the magazine, it's free to download. It's the I4S magazine. You just have to sign up for it and you get it online. The, 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 uh, the back issues are available from our website, i4s.org. And it's got lots and lots of information about what I've talked about and a lots of lots of else. I hope everyone here is already registered if, or uh, signed up for it. If not, please go ahead and do that. And I just finished by saying, remember, this is the I4S mission. That's why I'm here with you today. And that's the stuff that we do. And that's me. And um, I'm happy to take questions or have a Bob wants to run it now. And I don't know what time it is and how we've got on, but I think I'm just about on time. <laughs> Rob, you're spot on time. What a brilliant talk. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, you'd be keen to know that um, the actual number of attendees went up since you started. We're now at 38. Um, <laughs> so very good. You, you've attracted and kept your audience. Um, but every time, every time you do a talk, Rob, it, it feels like a pet talk. It feels like I want to get up and do something. It's really great. Uh, so thank you for that. Right, everyone, 38 people here. Um, so I've noticed that there's a few things in the, in the comments that I've been looking for that uh, could be, uh, could be uh, uh, questions. Uh, but get, get your thinking caps on. If you've got any questions, uh, let me know. Unmute yourself and so on. I'll just scan down them myself now, Bob, as well. Okay, so um, uh, first question I've got is uh, from, I think it was from Aditya. Uh, what does DART stand for, or do we know? Didn't quite catch that. And uh, what does DART stand for? Is it double asteroid redirect test or something? Yeah, I'm I'm not familiar with that one. It's um, Bob. Do you want to help me out at all? Because I'm not look, not looked into that one particularly. But um, and I could waffle. I'm very good at waffling sometimes. But uh, I don't want to jump in on something I don't know an awful lot about. So uh, any other interesting questions that I can answer with about the the, to the talk or in fact I can see the question there. Sorry. Aditya, that I don't, I don't know enough to tell you any great detail, but it must be, uh, it must be an attempt to redirect asteroids. Obviously, anyone here want to jump in? If not, any other questions you want to ask? Or I'll scan up and down. I'm looking it up now, and uh, I'll post the results on here. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, I, I'm. Let me see. So. I'm an avionics expert who has become a space enthusiast because my original degrees were in astronomy, astrophysics, and radio astronomy at Droddle Bank. And I became very interested in space, but I, you know, I, I became a bit of a mercenary, joined the military, did 20 years, um, but never stopped being a space geek. So when I left the Air Force, I decided I'm going to spend all my time doing the stuff I like to do, which I'm very lucky to do now. Uh, but I'm no expert, and I can see some hot experts on the... On the screens here at the moment if anyone wants to jump in at any time any other questions about the talk hello Rob. hello hello Adam. Adam. hello um, I just have something about the, uh, the possibility that uh, those centaurs in high inclination orbit might be ISOs interstellar objects there was a paper published that rebutted that paper okay uh, 
Yeah, and it uh, indicated more likely a uh, source of those objects would be uh, a reservoir in the solar system somewhere rather than interstellar. So there is some scientific debate as to whether those high inclination centaurs are interstellar objects or maybe they could have originated somewhere within the solar system. Yeah, the, the paper, the, I read the monthly notices paper and it was, it was saying that they could be interstellar objects, they could be in stable orbits. Mm. It's very unlikely to come from the relaxation of the solar system's cloud. But then there's the Oort cloud out there all the time anyhow, Ooh. which could easily yes. Yes. be part of this supply and these and the, yes. the Oort cloud could be half full of interstellar objects effectively. Well, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Marshall seems to think that would be about 1% of those uh, Oort cloud objects would be interstellar objects, in fact. Yeah. Where got the figure from, I don't know. But <laughs> I should look out the one that... Uh, was cast doubt on this. I can post it on on uh, on chat if you like, and can post yeah. uh, post a link to it. Thank you. I'll do that. But wouldn't it be great if we could get there in a reasonable Absolutely. time? Find out and find There's out. Enough time to loiter around and visit a few of these and yes. uh, find out for ourselves. That would be excellent. Yeah. There it is. I posted it on uh, the chat feed. Thanks, Adam. Okay. Good talk, Rob. By the way, I thank appreciate you. That. Thanks. Okay, we're open for any more questions. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Adam. Oh, oh, oh. The good news is about the cost, the lower Earth or getting to low Earth orbit. I mean, if you if you look at what, for example, NASA's missions have been doing, they've been decreasing steadily for missions into the outer solar system over the last 20 30 years so i don't know what are we down to one every 10 years now that might go up again if the costs start to decrease although i'm not sure you know where all the costs are. it might be the mission control for 40 years it might be an expensive business i don't i don't know maybe if we can automate some of these things much more we can cut the cost, but we've got to get more missions than one every 10 years. So fingers crossed that will happen if we can get to low Earth orbit easily. I'd very much like to be able to, to clean up um, the space debris, uh, find a way we can do that so we can build ourselves a space elevator and really open up the solar system. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we can see some major progress in my lifetime still. Oh, yes, I tried to keep to some sort of near term stuff, Bob, in this talk. Um, I, I can I can I can definitely imagine elevators being used on asteroids, the moon. Just a, just it blows my mind. Is is uh, have we got the proponents on Peter? Is he on here for elevators? It just blows my mind to think of it on terms of the Earth using one on the Earth. But it, you know, it could be possible in the future. Well, the Obiashi Corporation is committed to try and build one by 2050. I'll be interested to see how they get on. Yes, I think we've got two on. I think we've got um, Peter Robinson, uh, who's also given us a talk here. And, and of course, my daughter, Amelia, who's, who was an intern at ISEC uh, earlier this summer. Do you, any of you two want to say anything about that? Um, I think Peter's gone, so I think it's just me. Do you have a question? <laughs> So you, you, you did a paper about um, uh, uh, moving, um, uh, um, moving derelict satellites to become part of the apex anchor of a space elevator. Um, so how, um, how, how uh, and you're using, and I noticed that other people have mentioned a space tug, you were using a space tug to do that. How, how did the space tug get there? Did you launch it or did you use the elevator? So um, I'm not sure how, um Every, much everyone knows about the space elevator so the idea is to initially like launch a satellite into orbit and then release a tether down to earth and so that will create like an initial tether and then using that you'll send more climbers or sort of like lift elevators up the tether and that will like strengthen it and like make it more stable and then as you do that you can also send things up the tether so that's where like i would send the tug up to then go and collect derelict satellites to attach to the apex anchor to keep it taut so yeah does that answer your question yes thank you for that okay so uh, back to back to rob's talk have we got any more questions for rob um i wonder if i could pick something in um uh, i'm buying this uh, 
being a theme running through your, your talk this afternoon, Mr. Swinney, and I, I, I would like to echo what everybody else said, it's really fascinating. Um, it's the time required for a lot of these missions. Uh, the, the time to get to the target, whatever the target is, and then the, the time spent at, 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 the, at the object or, or class of objects. You mentioned mission control time. And of course, this involves people's working lives. So you really want to, obviously, want to get cut down the amount of time it, it takes to travel through the solar system to get to the, the far outer regions you've been exploring with us this afternoon, so that the maximum amount of working time is spent on the actual science at the destination. Now, you mentioned a number of propulsion techniques. There's another one um, which uh, I've had some involvement in. One or two people here will, will know what I'm talking about. There's a, a, an aerodynamic vehicle called Wave Rider. It's an original British concept, hypersonic shape. Um, uh, I'm not, there's a long history to this. I'll, I'll try and cut this short. But back in the 1980s, a group that I was involved in, ASTRA, the Association of Scotland's Research into Astronautics, we had a practical Wave Rider research program looking at the, retaining the high speed features but building at low speed features. That's a whole other story. But JPL, got interested in the possibility of using wave rider shapes um, to execute what, what you call aerogravity maneuvers, whereby you fly into the, and I've got a, a model here of the wave, basic wave rider shape. I don't know if anybody can see this, um, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a delta wing basically, but, but turned down to produce a carrot shape. And it flies into the, as a re-entry vehicle for the Earth's atmosphere, it would actually ride, it would generate a shock wave off the very sharp leading edges. And unlike the space shuttle or space capsules, would actually fly in the re-entry regime, not merely have to tolerate it, because the heat would be re-radiated from the top. It's an aerothermodynamics system. I'm simplifying things a lot. Um, but one of the potentials of wave rider shapes is if you fly them into the upper atmosphere, for example, this was considered for solar probe in the 1980s, and that's why JPL got interested in the work we were doing, uh, because we were about the only people really would, were looking at wave riders in detail. But the plan was to fly a wave rider shape upside down through the upper atmosphere of Venus at higher than Venus's escape velocity and bend the trajectory using aerogra the gravity and the aerodynamic forces that the vehicle could handle, basically an aerogravity assist maneuver. To get very close to the sun. Now, the, 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 at that point, they're wanting to avoid the Jupiter gravity assist that they have used because of the very hostile radiation environment around Jupiter. It didn't come to anything, but what, what our discussions, and we actually had Jim, Dr. Jim Randolph, who was the Advanced Mission Engineering Design uh, in charge of that department, the JPL, came. In fact, we had a meeting in my flat in Lawrence in 1985 with the whole team, and he stayed over that weekend. The, the long-term effect of that was it made JPL very much aware of the wave rider concept and its potential for aerogravity assist. And what they went, then went on to do back at JPL, although the mission we were talking about didn't fly, but it was fascinating doing the work. They, they've looked at the, the possibility of aerogravity assist for all sorts of very fast uh, uh, interplanetary transits within the solar system. For example, going from the Earth to Jupiter in five years. And, and this is done by, by uh, the point of an aerogravity assist, it can eject a spacecraft into non-Keplerian trajectories. Uh, you don't have to stick to the Keplerian, Keplerian route. Now, what that would mean is that we could project uh, uh, the kind of the class of missions that uh, Mr. Swinney has been talking about, uh, very much shorter crossing times. You get to the far outer solar system very much faster using this technique. The problem is, of course, if you want to slow down and go into orbit something at the other end, you've got the problem of slowing down. But let's solve one problem at a time. Um, but I, I, uh, and, and, and J, I, I kept in touch with JPL and Jim Randall for quite a few years afterwards, and he, he sent me regularly sent me the papers that they looked at for this, uh, which I still have. If that technique would be of any inter interest at all to those of you at the Interstellar Studies and Studies Institute who are looking at what you've described as interstellar precursor missions, I'd be quite happy to forward that on. Um, uh, I haven't looked at these for quite some time, although I'm still working on wave rider that's low, low speed applications, but that's a whole other area. But I'm just offering that as another possible technique for getting to where we want to get to in the far, far outer solar system a lot faster than we can at the moment. Obviously, the vehicles would be launched by 
conventional chemical rockets. But as you pointed out, Mr. Swinney, that's potentially getting a lot cheaper. And if the, the mission times can be cut down, then the mission, the mission costs are cut down considerably as well. Because a lot of the money goes into paying the salaries of the, the very clever scientists who have to work on these for a long time. And obviously the scientists will want to be able to get results much quicker within their within their working career. Uh, what's the working career of a scientist now? 40, 50, maybe 60 years. Um, and if most of that's taken up with waiting for the, the mission to get there. Um, that's that's not very terribly productive. Sorry if I've gone on a bit for a rather long time, but I'll just offer that as another possibility for achieving interstellar precursor missions. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, I certainly recall the uh, discussions in the 1980s, I think, uh, about wave riders, but I've not uh, looked into it much since. I'd be interested to receive the information that you have if you want to forward it through. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. We've got to transit as fast as we can to these objects or our targets. And then if we can, we want to be able to slow down, which is doubling the, well, is it squared, isn't it? It's four times yeah. it slow down again. Uh, if we wanted to go into orbit, because you know, to chase, we normally chase the planets into uh, to, to into orbit. We, we sneak up on them to go into orbit. We have to, and that's not feasible if we want to go 100 AU or 200 AU. And um, you're right. We need another. We need a solution to that. Well, this there's is, a but, but laser, absolute laser, laser push light sails acting as brakes rather than, <laughs> than accelerators. But there's there's all sorts of possibilities. Um, well, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, should I just send that on to the, the institute? If you if you would, or if, you, if you've got links, you can just drop them in the Zoom chat if you want to. That's uh, an option. Or if you haven't got right, the well, hand, well, well, I have them. I have them just now, but I need to. I think I probably. I, I, I mean, I have full whole files on this, but I'll assemble it into what will be a useful order rather than swamping you with. <laughs> Send it to me by email. It's on the on the uh, slides. Uh, my email. Okay, address. I'll I'll do that um, uh, because I've got a vast amount of stuff about wave ride, everything from low speed to super super hypersonic speeds. And I'd like to thank Jerry for his comments. We obviously need to spend more research into teleportation because my other half, all she ever says to me is, "I don't want to know. I don't want to know until you've sorted out teleportation." <laughs> and uh, it's bad enough just flying to Florida all the time, but uh, that's by the by. Yeah, I think we are getting more further and further out with our ideas at the moment. I think but that's that's brilliant. I enjoyed I enjoyed listening to that. Um, right, do we have any more uh, questions for Rob? Are, 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 how many of the missions you discussed, Mr. Swinney, are actually, as it were, sort of on the drawing board, particularly with NASA at the moment? Well, that Lucy mission, they're actually building the spacecraft now. So that's supposed to go in 2021. Right. So um, uh, the, the Johns Hopkins 1000 AU, they just call it Instellar Probe, is just still a paper study at the moment. They're no further forward than that. All right. It's quite a sophisticated design they've come up with to go with 1000 AU. And they're targeting, you know, 20 AU per year, that sort of speed. Uh this this is the nearest term technology I normally talk about because usually I'm talking about fusion drives and all sorts. But uh, I'd like to see some of these things happen now in my lifetime. That's the that's the goal. Any more questions? I see there's a fair few people without their cameras on, so I assume they're all asleep. Or... <laughs> Uh, just camera shy. Camera shy, yes. I, I tend to stay with the camera off normally. Who do I recognise? Yeah, quite a few names I recognise as well. It's good to see everyone on online. I think there's another question in the chat by Arthur Farrow. Do you see it? Oh yes. How would laser cells be used for breaking? Uh, well, you know, originally Jim oh, Bob. It'd be looking, going in the wrong direction, wouldn't it? <laughs> no, well, who is it? Bob? Bob, Rob, Robert Forward. Forward, thank you very much. So he came up with a design for braking, where if you imagine that if you had the, the centre of the uh, sail would pop out, so the bigger part of the sail, like a disc, would carry on going forward 
and could reflect the laser rays back to the smaller sail, which re retard the spacecraft that's popped out of the center of the, uh, the big sail. So the big sail, the middle bit pops out, the big bit carries on and can reflect the laser base coming from your solar system or wherever you're, you originate from and could slow down in theory the, the smaller sail um, so, the, so the bigger bit isn't attached to the spacecraft after it's deployed? No, it would be separated, it would go forward. And in fact, he thought of a way of doing that four times so you could get a return flight, if you imagine doing that three or four times. I think, it would, I think what breakthrough Starshot are talking on 200 gigawatt laser now, I think we're going up and up in terms of giga, uh, gigawatts. So, But breaking is possible in that sort of idea, just pluck out the middle sphere effectively with a smaller sail and that with the bigger sail would reflect light onto it and slow it, retard it in its direction it's going. Wouldn't that still be accelerating the larger sail? The larger sail would increase its velocity um, wherever it was going but I guess if your target was to slow down this mm. payload you would just accept that as a, mm. a, a consequence. Interesting. Bob forward as in a dragon's egg. That's right. <laughs> he also wrote a very good book about anti nitro propulsion, which I have a copy of. Well, you know, I'm sorry I forgot his name briefly. There's so many Bobs around, you get confused sometimes. <laughs> but he is one of the leading insights from people with insights from the earlier days, from the oh. 50s and 60s. You know, he's oh. he got all, involved with all sorts of things. Oh. Amazing characters. Yeah, I, I don't think he's around anymore, unfortunately. But no, he's a very dandy dresser. <laughs> Can we any more questions? I always say that interstellar spacecraft will be built by Roberts. That's my. <laughs> <laughs> I'm game. <laughs> uh. My other heart also tells me not to tell any jokes online as well, so I apologise for my terrible sense of humour. Okay then, well, uh, we've still 28 participants left. Um, is there any, any last minute questions? Because otherwise I'm going to call it a day. Please oh. do remind me to sit in on uh, Mark Hemsell's talk when he comes back in, in March, you're staying, so remind me to join in on that one. You, I think you're on the email list, so you'll get the emails with all of the, uh, the joining links. Oh, this Steve's may have something. Yeah, no, it's not so much a, a question rather than um, a vote of thanks to all of you at I4IS for Principium, or Principium, however you want to call it, but to uh, make those Principium. Principium. <laughs> Principium. Principium. Thank you. Can you <laughs> um, <laughs> no, that's, it's wonderful to have those issues available. Um, so um, I need to study up more, a lot more on, on science and theory. Um, but uh, to actually make those available to everyone um, is, is very kind of you, if I may say so. I'll, I'll, I'll and well that. worth downloading. I'm, I'll second that, Steve. You're welcome. And I can see John Davis is online, so I'll embarrass him by saying he's the editor for Principium or Principium. And um, I think the latest issue is like 100 pages. It was just amazing. So well done. Well done, John. You don't have to read all of it, by the way, but you can try. I'd just like to say I did post a note earlier about um, trying to subscribe and not having received the um the confirmation email um that has now come through so i shall be reading and reading and reading so, and here is my uh 3d oh excellent model which sits on my shelf <laughs> great model yes yeah, so all the back issues are available as well so you just go to the website and find the back issues so some more I'm downloading them as we speak. <laughs> uh, that, that was me when I first discovered Principium. I, I downloaded them all. <laughs> really you weren't good, really worrying that they were going to go behind a paywall, were you, Rob? Uh, Bob? <laughs> well, I'm a member now, remember? Okay. <laughs>
Because oh yes, I should promote that you, you can. End. I should promote that you can join the IFRS as a subscribing member, as it's called. So you can see that online as well, if you wish to. Uh, mainly, you support our activities, which is working with students, doing scholarships, working on projects, and um, that's where the finances go. But you can see that all online if you at the website. And there's a discount for BIS members, of course, as well. So if you remember to do it which i didn't unfortunately there you go any other final questions i don't know if you want to wrap up after this bob but it looks like mark has got his hand up mark uh, it's not a question actually rob it was you just mentioned the student connection and i was just going to give uh, uh, a plug for our next talk our october talk which uh, is uh, all about the school's competition for rocketry um, which is designed to uh, infuse uh, students uh, and get them into uh, uh, rocketry in space so do uh, John Jacob will be talking in October so please do cut everybody please uh, do uh, sign up for that one thanks Mark yeah good idea and also of course it'll be part of World Space Week absolutely so, um, and that's just uh, it starts uh, in a little over a week so uh, any of you who've got um, space related events in the first half of October, please do register them. Thank you, Steve. So um, to, to wrap this up, first, um, I just want to say a big thank you to Rob Swinney yet again for such a super talk. Um, always good, always really exciting. Uh, and I love them, and I hope you'll do another one with us, maybe in another six months, nine months, maybe, maybe. Uh, we can talk about that. <laughs> After Mark. And, uh, and anyway, uh, uh, 38 today. Uh, thank you ever so much, everyone, for joining us and supporting the event. It's great to see you all and uh, have a great weekend. Well, thanks for organising this. It's been great. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much and well done. And thanks again, Rob. Fantastic talk as ever. Absolutely. Thank thanks, Rob. Thanks, thanks everybody. Goodbye. Cool.